it's Melissa Miller. Um, I graduated UCLA in 2019. Um, so I started in 2015 and that was my first exposure to Russian. Uh, no family, no friends Russian. I was just, honestly, I had, I was political science, um, international relations, and I knew I needed a foreign language requirement. <laughs> um, I was really interested in studying abroad in general, and I thought, hey, Russian sounds cool. <laughs> I didn't know that it would eventually become my main focus, um, but that's kind of just how life works. <laughs> um, oh yeah, so this is me, всем привет. Um, I was a domestic Russian flagship student. Um, for um, those of you who don't know what that means, it means I was in the flagship program. I did the summer abroad, but I did not do the full year abroad. Um, I have friends who did, I'm sure um, Professor Kresin could connect you with them if you're interested in that experience. Um, but I did do the summer in Almaty and it was fantastic. I'll talk a little bit about it in a second. Um, but yeah, so my progression <laughs> sort of through my Russian speaking journey, um, I started with Russian one in the fall, just like some of you guys. Um, I did the summer session. So it was the intensive um, over the summer, I think A and B sessions. Um, it was really fun. We had a close sort of small group of people and you know, when you're doing Russian four hours a day and <laughs> you have those people with you to help you through, it was a nice group. <laughs> um, 101 uh, A through C, I believe that was with Professor Kresin. Um, uh, our last in Almaty, um, that is the summer program, eight weeks. Um, I think it's Russian language abroad something program, something to that effect. Um, 102 series, I did CLS, the Critical Language Scholarship Program. I'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, that was in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Uh -huh. um, the 103 series, honestly, I can't remember what if that was the exact uh, wording of it because I think it changes maybe year to year, but it was sort of Russian through different lenses. So Russian through film, Russian through art and architecture, Russian through performing arts. Um, and it was really, really neat. And I've actually, um, since sort of spoiler, I um, moved to St. Petersburg last year. Then the pandemic happened, but <laughs> I, in St. Petersburg, I actually found the knowledge that I learned, I gained during the 103 series, very helpful in museums and stuff. And it was, it, I nerded out quite a few times. Um, so, uh, yes, so I moved to St. Petersburg to teach English and ultimately to further my Russian speaking abilities. Um, and my little passion project this year, uh, this last year, I launched a sort of language and travel blog, all about encouraging people to study Russian and travel to Russian speaking countries. So that's been my little passion project. Um, we'll talk about it. So my first part, our last in Almaty, um, fantastic program. I loved it. It was super hard, <laughs> not an easy endeavor, um, but it was an amazing spirit experience in terms of sheer exposure and immersion. Um, we had small class sizes. This was our, our class. <laughs> we had, I think there were four, maybe five groups like this. So in total, there were more than this amount of students, but these are the students that I spent mm, five hours with in a classroom every day <laughs> together. Um, and we had uh, two teachers who each taught two different subjects. Um, so we had speaking, we had reading, writing, uh, phonetics. So they covered all the bases. Um, we had a language partner. For this program, you definitely need to show initiative. They have a certain amount of language partners and students, and you need to reach out to them. Um, we had a cultural excursion, probably once, maybe twice a week. If I'm going too fast, please let me know. Um, we had a language pledge. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's basically when you pledge to, to speak the language, your target language, while you're on campus, while you're outside of campus with your host family, of course, the only exception being to call home. Uh, you're allowed to call home in English. 
um, or your native language, whatever that might be. Um, and it was great to explore Kazakhstan. Um, we were able to visit many different cities and sort of natural parks, which I didn't, national parks, which I didn't know before going. Um, and that was probably the highlight in my eyes. The nature there in Central Asia in general is just absolutely gorgeous. It was phenomenal. Um, and it's definitely not a place that I would have found myself if I hadn't gone through this program. So I'm very grateful that I was able to. Um, originally, when I started learning Russian, I had my eyes set on St. Petersburg. And so I was like, oh, I want to go to St. Petersburg. But I'm very happy that I didn't right away because I got to experience all these different post-Soviet um, spaces and just sort of see how they all connect together. Um, so yeah, then I did CLS um, the following summer, summer of 2018. This was, so our LASP was intense. CLS um, was sort of just a little bit more intense <laughs> in terms of sort of class structure, the language pledge was much more strictly enforced um, to everyone's benefit. <laughs> um, and we had more, a little bit more homework. It was about three to four hours a night. Um, what else do I have here? Language partners in this program are mandatory two hours a week. Um, they were paid for it. So best believe they reached out to you if you didn't reach out to them that week because <laughs> uh, they wanted you know, to get paid. So, but it's a great opportunity to practice speaking um, and speaking with someone your own age, you are put into a host family and depending on your preferences and the host families they have available, um, you're not always with someone your age, your own age. So it was nice to be able to, you know, have that kind of conversation and ask about topics that maybe you wouldn't feel comfortable or not feel comfortable, but that you wouldn't necessarily be having with your host mom or your host dad. Um, so it was fun. <laughs> that was when I was told that I spoke like a textbook. And I was very, very happy about that. <laughs> but then realized, okay, I think this is how she's going to help me sound more natural, which was, I was very happy to hear. Um, so same with the Our Last program. Uh, not only are you in Bishkek, so in your host city, but you get to explore outside and go throughout the country. Um, this was in Ala Archa. Um, it's actually only about an hour outside of Bishkek, but it was just a national park, breathtaking. <laughs> um, this was on top of the Barana Tower with my language partner, um, which was a trading post I can't remember the date, but it was like an ancient trading post on the Silk Road. Um, so it was just so fascinating to sort of be near all these historical places within driving range. Um, the CLS program is um, all expenses are paid for. Um, sorry, I probably should have mentioned that earlier. It's um, a pretty rigorous um, program to apply to and to get into. Um, so I... I applied actually, did I apply two or three times? Um, I only got in once. So if you don't get in the first time, try, try again. It's worth it. Um, it was an amazing, amazing program. I, I was very, very fortunate to have gone. Um, and with this one, you're also able to do independent travel um, within the country. So we use the opportunity to go see another major city in the south of Kyrgyzstan, um, Osh. So that was great. Um, I don't think I need to harp on the benefits of immersion learning, <laughs> um, but I had two photos that I wanted to show because they made me laugh, uh, or at least one did. Um, <laughs> and I remember this picture be specifically because when I was told that I spoke like a textbook, it's because I was still very rigid in my language learning, I'm sure. Professor Kresin can attest to my many questions of how does this translate exactly? <laughs> um, but through studying abroad, you kind of come to understand that you can't really, <laughs> languages aren't meant to be a direct translation of one another. Um, and I remember obsessing about this picture. I took it because I thought trash, no 
throw. I was like, what? You need, we need another word here. <laughs> and I think I, I came back and I asked about it. Um, and it's just, it was something that I hadn't been exposed to previously. So, you know, walking home, my way home from school, it's these kind of things that catch your eye that, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily get um, in a classroom or in a textbook. Um, oh. This one was funny. <laughs> um, it says, you know, caution, be careful, evil dog. <laughs> So that's how I learned this word, Zlaya. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, good, so staying with the host family, um, I kind of touched upon it's a fantastic part of studying abroad in general. Um, you really feel like you're one of the family, you're part of their family. They, I haven't, I have, I'm trying to think of people in both study abroad programs and I, I can't think of one experience in which participants in the program said that they at least they weren't comfortable with their host families pretty much every single person really enjoyed their host family and felt that they made they went the extra mile to really incorporate you and try to take you on family outings and take you to um weddings and any events that they have i went to a two-year-old's birthday party i went to a wedding I went to a graduation party. So they, they really, really bring you to everything that they can. Um, and again, it's just that sheer amount of exposure of waking up in the morning and, you know, saying hello, good morning and speaking, you know, talking over coffee before you go to school. So um, this was my second host family in Kyrgyzstan. Um, you might notice they, <laughs> they um, were particularly wealthy um, that's not always the case. My first um, host mom, you know, was much more of a sort of not reasonable, but, you know, more modest um, living situation. And it was fine. It was great. Um, but, you know, so you never know. Um, I, you can put in pets, children, um, sort of the age range of people that you want to live with. But beyond that, um, you know, they kind of pair you uh, as your, you know, as your sort of activities and your interests suit the family and how those kind of match up. So I, I've always said that I wanted, or I always said that I wanted kids. Um, they're a great resource when uh, to live with when trying to learn the language. Um, I don't know, there's just sort of this feeling of not being judged with kids, not that other people judge you, but you know, that sort of vulnerability you have when you're speaking a foreign language um, I don't have that kind of vulnerability as much when I'm speaking with kids, so I always liked to be in a house with kids. Um, and pets. This was my host mom's pet in Russia, and it, he, she loved my computer, laying on my computer. <laughs> I loved it, too, so. <laughs> um, before you study abroad, I don't know um, how many of you are interested in studying abroad. I 110% recommend it. Um, but just a few tips I thought I'd include in this presentation um, is, to, so tip one, keep a log before you go of your daily activities and things that you encounter in your life here in California or here in wherever you might be. Um, because those daily activities, those things, you're going to be having not the same, obviously, because you're in a new country. Um, but you're going to be waking up, brushing your teeth, drinking coffee, drinking tea, getting on maybe a bus, getting on a marshuka. Um, so those sort of daily routine vocabulary uh, points are important. Um, tip two. Um, oh, so that kind of speaks to that as well. Um, familiarize yourself with to topics that are relevant to your daily life. Um, you know, if you if you are passionate about AI and you talk about it all the time, that's great. Um, it's probably not something that you're going to be using quite frequently in daily life at school. Um, so I found it helpful to go back and really go to the basics um, and review the basics of sort of daily routines um, and stuff that I would definitely be doing and talking about every day while studying abroad. Um, and sort of my last tip is that you don't need to memorize everything before you go. Um, in fact, you shouldn't. 
um, studying abroad and speaking with native speakers is all about sort of putting yourself in those situations where you don't know what you're talking about or how to express what you're talking about. But I, I recommend maybe having some sort of template of saying like, sort of if you're trying to talk about, I don't know, a firefighter, having some, some sort of template to say, uh, this is a profession that works with, mm, this is a person who, you know, this is, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of a job that works with X. So sort of having those ways of describing terms that you don't know um, would, will prove helpful for when you're in a situation when you don't know what to say. Um, continuing. Um, so I moved to St. Petersburg in 2019, the end of 2019, and I love St. Petersburg so much. Um, I kind of just decided after graduation that I'm not totally sure what I want to do with my life. I know that I enjoy Russian. <laughs> I enjoy making study guides and I do vocabulary lists on my sort of as my me time. So I thought, I'll just keep going with what I like to do. You know, that's kind of, I guess, the rule of thumb. So I decided that probably the best way to support myself while I'm there is to teach English. Um, so um, I got my certificate of, it's called TEFL, um, Teaching English as a Foreign Language. There's also the CELTA. Um, these aren't absolutely necessary um, if you want to teach English in St. Petersburg, although I definitely recommend it. Um, not only do you, you know, refamiliarize yourself with uh, English grammar rules, which are a lot more complex than I thought <laughs> that I'd remembered in grade school, um, but also just how to lead a classroom, how to structure a lesson, what elements to have, um, sort of questions to ask to make sure that your students truly understand a topic. Um, so classroom management and all that jazz was also taught, which was really helpful. Um, if you're interested in teaching English abroad, especially, um, I mean, I can't speak for every country, obviously, but I had no trouble finding a job <laughs> as an English teacher. Um, I'll just, I'll say that. I applied to a few places um, and the first company that I actually I think, yeah, so the first company that I got an interview for, um, I fell in love with them, love the staff, love my colleagues, I love my students. Um, and we just clicked, so I, I signed a contract. I got my working hours and um, I got healthcare, which was, I, I don't know about that. That was just something that I was like, oh, I'm kind of an adult now, I guess. Um, so a learning group is my school. This is one of our classrooms. Um, we have three locations. I was telling Professor Crescent um, before we started. So it's nice to have sort of variation in my week. I go to three different locations and I have lots of students. Um, so yeah, it's um, in terms of a salary, I make, I definitely make a, sort of a good salary for Russia, for St. Petersburg. Um, but because of the ruble and the dollar, not, not a job you should get if you're trying to um, sort of fill up your bank account. <laughs> um, I'm living well in Russia. Using that money in America probably wouldn't get me that far. So just something to consider um, if you were considering this line of work. Um, what else? Oh, some photos. Um, so I was telling you that, da, da, da. oh yeah, so I have three locations. Um, my first location is on Nevsky. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with St. Petersburg geography at all, but it's the main, I think actually the original street, if I'm not mistaken, of St. Petersburg. Um, and there's just beautiful monuments all along the street. Um, I love Metsky. Um, But so I walk down this one tiny street with all these lanterns and beautiful buildings, and it's just a dream. And I, here's Kazansky Sabor, and I walk through here. I walk through there. This is Hram Spasa Nakravi. Um, I'm sure you've you've all seen this cathedral um, or church um, <laughs> sort of in photos and stuff. Um, it's it's just it's a wonderful city. If you ever get a chance to go to St. Petersburg, 
11 out of 10 recommend it. <laughs> um, if you're interested in leaving, living abroad or going abroad and not through an academic program, you're going to have to set up housing. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was I got housing through the study abroad programs, which is great. Um, but of course, going out on my own, I had to figure things out for myself. And um, that's been a very fun process. There's a bunch of apps in Russia. Um, I went on one called Avido um, to find housing. And it's kind of like any one that you would have here in America. You know, you can kind of scroll through and look at photos, see the amenities, the price. I called the landlord and he asked me to come for a showing. I fell in love and the rest is history. <laughs> um, it's really great. I think it, it, it used to belong to a famous Soviet ballerina. Um, or I don't know, a male male ballet dancer. I don't know if that's the correct term, but um, so he had his portraits were kind of all over the place, which is cool. Um, oh, didn't know that would be a thing. But, you know, it's all fun and games until, oops, until your, I had another thing here, until your neighbors, your upstore, upstairs neighbor's ceiling collapses. Um, you get this fun dirt coming out of every pipe. Um, you don't know what it is. Somehow you have to explain it to your landlord so he can fix it. <laughs> so these are the kind of problems and um, situations that, again, you don't necessarily get from a textbook, let's say. Um, sort of situations that you have to think on your feet. And I guess that's all, that's the point of studying abroad, going abroad, putting yourselves in those uncomfortable situations. I learned, <laughs> I learned how to get myself through this one. So I'm feeling more confident than ever too. Um, had to ask if I could paint over this lovely drawing. Um, unfortunately, there are seasonal paints in Russia. So I'm gonna have to wait to paint over this uh, masterpiece till later. Um, hot water heater. I didn't know how to say that before, I do now. Um, I got extremely sick in when I first got there. I had a 103 fever um, and I had no idea how the healthcare, sy healthcare system worked there. So navigating that, um, never go to Ikea without measuring every inch of your apartment. I don't know if that's a living in Russia thing or just adult thing. Also centimeters, anyways. Um, I stared at this Wi-Fi router for 48 hours before calling the sort of electrician and him telling me, oh, it's broken. Oh, great, thanks, okay. But I have a new set of vocabulary that I didn't have before. <laughs> So these are kind of the different situations you might find yourself in. Hopefully not, but similar unexpected ones. Um, as I mentioned, I, <laughs> I love to travel. Um, I sort of got the travel bug when I started, when I studied abroad in Kazakhstan, when I studied abroad in Kyrgyzstan, and I decided that I, my ultimate goal was to see all 15 post-Soviet states. So um, I'm I've been to Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Armenia, Moldova, and Belarus so far. I'm hoping, oh, and Russia. I'm hoping to go to the Baltics um, on my way back to St. Petersburg in August. Um, I had to come back due to COVID, unfortunately, but I should be there by the end of summer, hopefully to see the end, tail end of White Nights when the sun doesn't set <laughs> um, in St. Petersburg. So I'm hoping to do that. Um, but yeah, I mentioned Belarus. I don't know how quickly to go through these, but um, it's just using, having Russian, being able to speak Russian, um, even the basics really, to be able to go through these countries. There's not a lot of tourism in these countries. Um, and, you know, obviously Russia has more tourism than say Turkmenistan, but um, having Russian as that common thread throughout is really helpful for navigating situations and being able to see parts of the world that aren't super common for tourists in general uh, to visit. So I, I have a lot of fun finding these off the beaten path spots like 
this very scary <laughs> monument. Um, this was in, I think, the south of Belarus, Brest, um, on the border with Poland, maybe? Uh, um, it was a monument to fallen soldiers of World War II. So again, sort of just history was all tying in and I just, I have such a fun time. Moldova, I mentioned, um, I went to, I think five or six cities in Moldova. It's a pretty small country, so you can get around quickly um, just by marshukas, um, minivans that have fixed routes. Uh, so I didn't need to take a train or fly or anything. Um, Armenia, I was actually in Armenia uh, when COVID hit. Um, unfortunately, I was, so the reason that I'm not in St. Petersburg now, I was, so work visas in Russia, I think in most countries, you have to apply for your work visa. You have to leave the country to do so. You have to apply at the embassy of whatever country you're trying to work in, and then you return. So my work visa expired. I was trying to go get a new one, and that's when the borders closed, unfortunately. So um, I had to come back. Um, this was Russia. I was able to go to Moscow. Um, I had to get a new passport entirely. Uh, so I had to go to the Moscow embassy. There's not a, an embassy, an American embassy in St. Petersburg, but I was able to take the train down, uh, the overnight train and see Moscow. So I'm kind of glad it happened. I was able to see a new city. Um, and so now, sorry, I know I'm talking for a very long time, but um, almost done. Um, this was, as I mentioned, my sort of passion project. Um, I really just enjoyed compiling my notes from college, from um, my Russian classes, from you know TV shows and movies that I've watched and vocabulary and grammar points. I just, I love making study guides. I think maybe eventually I want to teach Russian. So this is kind of my testing the waters and seeing how I like it so far. I like it a lot. <laughs> um, but so my, this um, passion project, this uh, website is a travel blog and sort of ling with language guides to help you. Um, so I have language travel guides for all the post-Soviet countries that I mentioned that I've been to. Um, I'm hoping to obviously add to them as I go. I wanna revisit all the countries and spend, um, I think I wanna spend about maybe a year or two um, after my work is done in St. Petersburg. So hopefully this is something that I continue for the next few years to come. Um, so travel guides, as I mentioned, learn Russian, I broke it down into five categories. So like the basics, grammar, practical vocabulary, practical conversation, and verbs with prefixes. Um, yeah, the bane of all of our existences. Um, <laughs> so I have a lot of fun with that. Um, these are just example sentence, example um, posts uh, to give you kind of a taste of the topics that I have articles on. Um, yeah, so I enjoy doing that. And the blog posts, of course, um, these are some examples. Um, yeah, I really enjoy just kind of writing about this, the experience of sort of being a solo female traveler, especially in a place with um, not much tourism. <laughs> so um, there's not a lot on the, I mean, there's a good amount of resources, but you know, it's not like you're going to France and you can get, you can look online for a million and one different travel guides. So um, I like being able to add to that sphere. And that is where I'm done lecturing. <laughs> um, if you have any questions at all, I think we're going to do like a little bit of questions. Um, but if after this at like 7.02, or I don't know if we have a fixed end time, you're like, ah, I should have asked that question. Um, feel free to reach out. I'm um, pretty good at responding to emails, um, <laughs> um, but also you can reach out on social media um, or text me. I put my phone number. So this should be good for another few months until my Russian number comes back. <laughs> um, all right, so that's the end of me talking. <laughs> um, all right, I see in the chat a few questions. Oh, sorry, I probably should have been looking at this while I went. Um, so um, actually maybe we can unmute and um, read your questions aloud uh, if you would like. Oh, thank you, Professor Crescent. Oh, thanks, Amy. 
Thanks, Juliet. Favorite all-time country I've traveled to so far? That's a very difficult question. Um, <laughs> I, I'd have to say Kazakhstan. <laughs> I mean, probably, be, maybe because it was my the first country I'd ever been to outside of the United States. Um, it's really interesting though, because I actually had a really hard time in Kazakhstan. I had um, never, as I just mentioned, I'd never been outside of the US. So I was really, really homesick. I didn't think I would be homesick. I've always considered myself a pretty independent person, um, but I was, it was weird. <laughs> I was homesick calling home every night, you know, crying, like I wanna come home, even though this was exactly what I wanted to do. And I knew that if I had gone home, I would have regretted it. Um, but if there's just something about going to a new country and sort of realizing how small your world is, I guess maybe that sort of travel bug slash initial impression really stuck with me. So I'd have to say Kazakhstan. Also the nature, oh my goodness. I had no idea there were so many alpine lakes and mountains and the nature was just absolutely incredible. I really liked Armenia too. Um, I wish I could have had more time there. Um, I'm, I really liked, all the ancient monasteries and the different, again, lakes <laughs> and mountains and trails to climb. I really, really like getting out into nature. Um, all right, can't use my mic, that is a-okay. Still in, um, so Amy asked if I'm still in, ho in touch with my host families and instructors. Yes, um, I haven't reached out to my instructors, actually, maybe, maybe I should. Um, I'm gonna do that after this. Um, but my host families, yes, um, we follow each other on Instagram and we message back and forth, um, I'd say about once a month, once a month. I actually, I got a, um, it's called a uh, kumus. It's the national instrument of Kyrgyzstan. It's a sort of like a little guitar. And so I got it at a bazaar when I was there. because so I was like, this is cool. I'm gonna learn a national Kyrgyz instrument. Um, and turns out my host sister was a child prodigy, just a genius. Um, and I came home with it and she was like, I'll teach you how to play. And I was like, amazing. Um, but I, I messaged her, I think a week ago about um, tuning it because mine was out of tune and I can't find many resources online for tuning a kumus. <laughs> so <laughs> um, yeah, good. Um, so I also, um, during your first and second year at UCLA, what was your typical study routine for Russian? Um, I didn't have much of um, a study routine outside of doing homework. Um, as you guys know, college is a very busy time with lots going on out, inside class, outside of class. Um, I just made sure to always stay on top of my homework, um, come into class prepared for the topic. Um, I did my best. <laughs> um, I would say in terms of outside the classroom, we, I tried to listen to podcasts as much as I could. Um, I've never had a good ear for languages and for any foreign language, it, I've, listening has always been my, my weakest point. So podcasts were very helpful. Um, also just to be consistently having it in my ear, having that exposure, I would, sometimes say words during conversation that I, I would think like, but where did I get that from? <laughs> like, I didn't learn that in a, in class or a textbook. And I'm like, oh, wait, that was the podcast. Um, so yeah, mainly just keeping myself exposed to it, you know, taking these courses, you got enough on your plate to study. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see. At what point in your studying at UCLA study abroad, did you feel like you achieved fluency in Russian? <laughs> um, I'm still working towards that goal. So, and I, I, I think, um, you know, it's funny. I, I actually asked my coworkers the same thing. Um, my native Russian speaker coworkers who speak, in my opinion, fluent English. I asked them, how long did it take you to achieve fluency? And they both laughed at me. <laughs> they said, we're not fluent. I was like, yes, you are. So it's kind of, um, it's a sub very subjective term. Um, I think better maybe, I can touch upon conversational. Um, and that moment clicked for me um, when I was 
in a yurt in Kyrgyzstan. And um, I mentioned you can travel outside in the CLS program without the program. And so me and a few friends, we went to Lake Isikul and it was this beautiful lake where you can stay on the beach in yurts. And um, these neighboring people, na neighboring native Kyrgyz people invited us and they <laughs> they made barbecue for us. They um, gave us libations and um, it was just a night of fun. And I found myself not checking my translator. And I had this conversation with someone for probably two hours, we were just talking and I, sort of like stopped and I was like, I didn't check my reverso context once. So that was a little moment of pride for me. Um, so I'm still working towards fluency. I think I'll be working towards that my entire life, but um, conversational, I'd say maybe, um, what is that, three years in, but it's, it's all relative. It's relative to how much time you spend on it um, and sort of, mm, sort of meaningful interactions, yeah. Um, all right. Um, ha have you had any trouble speaking Russian in St. Petersburg? Yes. Some say that being a native English speaker can make it difficult to actually practice Russian due to the amount of Russians who want to practice English. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially in like the cities um, where people, they know sort of English from high school or university, but not enough to hold a conversation. So um, if they hear a little bit of an accent, some people, especially with the younger generation, will sort of switch to English because they think that they're helping you, but they also want to practice. Um, I usually just kind of keep speaking Russian. They don't get offended. You know, <laughs> it's their native language. It's easier for them. So um, I would say the difficulty of speaking Russian <laughs> uh, in Russia has been honestly, with just street language, um, it's kind of different. I mean, obviously it's the same language, but there's a lot more elements of conversational Russian that I wasn't aware of. So sort of getting familiar with that. Um, it's so funny. It's like when I mentioned my language partner talking about how I sounded like a textbook, she, there was one sentence in particular, I said like, thank you for waiting for me to cross the street. And I did the whole like, and she was like, you could have said that in like two words. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? So it's sort of understanding how like sort of the abbreviations and the um, sort of contractions, maybe not contractions, but the colloquial language was definitely something I struggled with at first, but I'm, I'm getting a hang of, yeah. Um, have you had trouble practicing Russian? Yeah, no, um, I'd say pretty much just in like restaurants and stuff, people will want to speak English to you, but you just keep speaking Russian. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you thought about teaching English in other Central Asian countries? Uh, and why or why not have you considered it? Um, I haven't, well, I haven't considered it because my eyes have always been set on St. Petersburg. Um, I would definitely consider it. Um, you know, I don't, whatever the future holds. I'm not planning on staying in the region um, for more than five years. I don't know, who knows? Um, but I definitely, I'd consider it if the, op if the opportunity arose. I really enjoyed Bishkek and Almaty. Um, I would definitely love to go to um, Tajikistan. Uh, I think it's pronounced Dushanbe um, and Uzbekistan. Um, yeah, I mean, when, with, with a sort of teaching certificate, and especially now online, everything's online, you can do it from anywhere. So I'm planning on traveling to all these countries while teaching English to be able to support myself. Um, so, you know, theoretically, yeah, I could teach English in, you know, <laughs> I could teach English in Azerbaijan for three months. I could teach English in Turkmenistan, Maybe not with the visa situation, but um, so you can bounce around. Uh, it gives you a little bit of flexibility in that in that regard. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> does anyone have any other questions? I I actually have one more question. I just thought it would be yeah. easier to say it. Um. So um, I'm going to be participating in CLS this summer, but like virtually. 
And I just kind of want to know like what you would recommend to like what you wish you would have known before, you know, doing CLS in terms of maybe like um, making the most of like all the resources that CLS gives you just any tips, maybe you would recommend using lots of like turning your homework into flashcards every day or I don't know any any tips that you had about your uh, studies with CLS. Hmm. So CLS is quite rigorous. Um, congratulations, by the way, that's awesome. Super excited for you. Um, in terms of studying and sort of taking your materials and getting the most out of them, I mean, that really, it really depends on the person. Um, I'm always a big fan, honestly, even through my, I think this, my website is sort of a, a testament to this of, um, I think you learn the best when you're able to teach it. Um, so being able to, um, yeah, Amy, you're welcome, um, to being able to take those materials and if you can successfully teach it to someone and if you can, and you understand everything that you're saying and why you're saying it, um, that always works. Um, so maybe you could form some sort of study group with people and maybe choose to different topics to assign to people that you could teach. Um, I, you will go crazy if you try to make everything a flashcard. Um, <laughs> don't get me wrong, it's a great tool for learning, absolutely, especially apps like Anki is really great because it has this sort of scientific formula of um, repeating words based on how comfortable you are with them and bringing them up at the right time. There's a million and one flashcard um, platforms like that, which are fantastic, but um, I think mostly just trying to maximize the amount of time that you're using your, um, the co everything that you learn in classes, maximize uh, fame and technique. Ooh, very cool. Um, maximize the amount of time you're speaking and using that information. Because if you use it and you apply it, you're gonna remember it a lot more. You're gonna be able to put it into the right context. Um, I've, I certainly went down a huge rabbit hole one of my years of trying to memorize words, but it didn't help me if you don't know how to use those words. <laughs> so um, combining like, if it's a noun, like what verbs are often used with this noun? Okay, write that as a phrase. If it's a verb, all right, what case is it? What direct objects can it take? Are there indirect objects? Stuff like that. So grouping it be so that you know that if you look at it, you can have a conversation about it and not just say the word in the definition. I don't know if that answered your question. Um, I'm sure I will think of something, <laughs> something will pop into my head tonight as well. Um, so sure. I'll contact you. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that totally makes sense, yeah. Um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, sure. if it's all right, if I, I just wanted to ask out of curiosity, do you remember what your uh, official like Russian level went up between both of your study abroads, like before you went to Kazakhstan and after, and then how CLS bumped you up to what level? If, if you're, if you know that or remember it. Yeah, so I don't remember the exact level that I was at, but I do remember being very impressed with how much I really grew during CLS. Um, I went up to levels on the, what is it, ACTFL, ACETFL, -A um, and my last one was advanced mid um, in 2018, so I, I felt, I felt really great about that, um, I was really, I, you know, you can go, you can study, study, study for so long and not feel like you've made any progress, but when you have the ability with the OPIs to kind of look back and say, well, I, definitely improved because that was my <laughs> score then this is my score now so it's um it's I used to hate OPIs um my last OPI I, I miss them which I know but my last OPI I found myself enjoying it um and I was like I remember I was in the my sort of director of studies office and I was on the phone and I was kind of like leaning back in my chair and I was like, if nothing else, if I get the same score, I'm at least more comfortable <laughs> speaking this language. 
Um, so I really enjoyed sort of those opportunities to see myself progress. Yeah, and then I definitely did with CLS, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. Um, and was Advanced Mid what you, the last run from CLS or was that what you graduated UCLA at kind of the Advanced Mid level? CLS. Um, yep, got it. I don't remember if I took an OPI my senior year, maybe. I don't think so. Hopefully it's higher now, <laughs> but I know that advanced mid was my last um, sort of benchmark. Yeah. You could take one for fun. You could sign up and just uh, see where you're at now after having uh, lived in St. Petersburg and traveled. That's a, that's a great idea, actually. I didn't know I could do that without the, without like an academic program. I'm going to look into that. I'm sure Dr. Crescent would know, but I always see the <laughs> Like, if you cancel, you must pay this much. And so I always thought then there's a way to pay for it in the beginning. Huh. But, um, I think people, oh, I don't know. I, I'm not going to talk about it. But I, I, I think you could. <laughs> Dr. Crescent could probably answer that. <laughs> no, I'll look into it. I'll definitely look into it. Because I actually, yeah, I found myself enjoying them in a weird, sadistic way. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? In terms of OPI, I can't resist seeing something. Um, the average in the United States norm in, among Russian programs with students who aren't as talented as ours, um, the average for a graduate Russian major is intermediate mid. So the fact that Melissa got advanced mid is says a lot for her. <laughs> yeah. It was a lot of work, but it was it, it pays off. It really, really pays off. It does. And yeah, like I said, it's not always, you know, language learning, you don't have this tangible sort of, um, I don't know, way to show results of I've improved this much, but with the OPIs, you definitely do. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Going once. Going twice. Oh, I had a question. Sorry. Um, uh -huh. So I have my first OPI um, coming up next month. Do you have any like tips? Because right now I'm like really, I'm really nervous about it, but I'm also like, it's okay. Like it's my first one. Um, but yeah, do you have any advice? Don't stress yourself out about it. I know that's easier said than done. Um, don't stress yourself out. Don't try to memorize anything. I went into my first few trying to memorize everything to make it the perfect OPI and it, it's not possible. Um, anything you mention is fair game, anything. <laughs> um, being a political science major, every time I would say, hi, I'm Melissa, I'm political science, da 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 da, da. So what's your take on uh, Kim Jong-un's recent? I was like, <laughs> so you have to be prepared for that. Um, so maybe just, if there's something about you that's like a talking point, sort of like where you're from, what your major is, your hobbies, be able to talk about that topic. Um, the final part of the OPI is like a role play situation and that you don't know going in. So they tell you the situation and you have to react to it. Um, if you don't know how to talk about that topic, Talk about what you do know. <laughs> um, my last OPI, um, though to be honest, I don't even know if this scored me any points, but um, it was, she was like, so you need to fire your housekeeper because they haven't, um, you need to fire your housekeeper, um, talk about maybe what they've done wrong and why you're letting them go. And I just remember thinking, I do not remember my vocabulary about cleaning the house in the slightest. And so I was like, okay, okay, well, I just need to talk. I need to show that I can talk in a situation. So I said, I started accusing them of stealing my TV and I loved that TV. My grandma gave me that TV. How could you steal my TV? And I had these channels and I, I watched this show every Wednesday. I was talking. And it, 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 was, it went much better than if I had tried to perfect a dialogue in my head with the, all the proper vocabulary that this person was looking to tick. Um, they just want to see 
how well you can carry a conversation um, and how well you can talk about things and pivot um, when they pivot. So have fun with it. It's a great way to show your, um, like I said, your progress from one point to another. Um, and I always started to think, you know, if I do horribly this time, next time it's gonna look like I went from zero to 100. So it's a win-win either way. <laughs> you score well now, or you score well in a year from now and you see even a, an even bigger difference. So just have fun with it. Yeah, that's what I'd say. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, last questions. Melissa was always the queen of questions. I don't think I've ever had a student who asked so many questions and it was just fabulous. It was really wonderful. Ask a lot of questions. We like questions. Yeah. I'm so glad you think that way because as I was taking my TEFL course and becoming a teacher, I just kept thinking, I was probably the most annoying student. <laughs> always questions. had questions, always wanting to understand. It was nice. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad. Thank you. Um, well, yeah. So if you have any questions for me after this, feel free to reach out. Um, like I said, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pin. I don't know, maybe don't reach out on Pinterest. I probably won't see that. But um, if you're interested, I have a monthly newsletter um, where I just kind of keep people up to date and show my sort of recent articles, things that are happening. Um, it's every month, so it's not, I'm not spamming you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, it's really nice to sort of get to know you guys and um, sort of see how the current flagship students are doing. Um, I'm, I can't imagine how hard it is to try to, the pressure of trying to acquire a foreign language online. Um, there's enough pressure to do it in person as it is. So good on you guys for continuing your language studies um, throughout this pandemic and being here. <laughs> um, that's really awesome. Um, and I wish everyone the best of luck. Is there a favorite place in Almaty that you went to that maybe you, we could end on so that people have something to look forward to? Yes. Well, there's a lot of um, karaoke restaurants that are a lot of fun. Love karaoke, great way to practice singing and learn new songs in a foreign language. Um, and there's a restaurant right by the university. I don't remember the name you will go there. I think they take you there on your first day even for like a, a lunch, everyone's there. Yes, because I remember being super, super jet lagged. Um, they have samsas, which are sort of bread dough with meat inside. Very standard, you know, every country has their variation. This place's samsas are so good and they're 20 cents and it, it's just, I miss that place a lot. <laughs> um, there's a hard rock cafe. Just don't go to it. <laughs> it's so American. <laughs> um, it's okay, go once, it's fun. All the portions are really big. Um, but you can find more authentic places to go that are much more enjoyable and memorable. <laughs> um, but yeah, karaoke places. The study abroad 15. Yeah, there's actually a gym, not that you like have to, I, but there's a gym right across the street from the university um, and all it's pretty cheap and um, gives you a new set of vocabulary, <laughs> definitely. And the people are all very confused about why a bunch of Americans are there. <laughs> it's a great Which way is to awesome. meet people. Yeah, and a great way to meet new people. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And earn those samsas. Earn those samsas. Oh, I had so many. 20 cent samsas. So good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you. It's just really great to hear about your experiences and how you're becoming a colleague. It's really wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's, um, it, it, especially as I mentioned, going through making this PowerPoint of showing the progression of, I did not know one word of Russian 
six years ago. And now I'm, well, will be slash have been living in Russia. <laughs> so it's, it's very cool to see um, all that I was able to do using sort of the tools that flagship provided. Um, so definitely take advantage of those while you're still at school. Um, I see a bunch of scholarships and stuff that I get emailed and I'm like, I'm not a student. <laughs> so take advantage of those resources you have um, and best of luck. Thank you so much. You got it, you got it.